Uh, everyone for the fr friends on the east coast uh, and good afternoon to the friends that are joining us uh, from uh, from the middle coast and then uh, good morning to those like me that might be joining us from uh, from the mm -hmm. north american and african uh, excuse me south american regions it uh, it gives me an honor to be uh, co-chairing today together with my, uh, my mentor and professor professor kato this uh, 10th of December webinar, ACNS YNS webinar, and uh, it is a pleasure uh, together to have uh, this opportunity with uh, my colleague uh, Sharon Theophilus to invite for uh, our talks. First, it's uh, our, our young uh, neurosurgeon, Dr. Daniel Encarnacion Santos, who is uh, currently a resident at uh, People Friendship uh, University, RUDN, in uh, Moscow and Russia. He will be joining us uh, with uh, a case report about the management of hydrocephalus after cerebellar pilosity gastrocytoma in pediatric patient. And uh, then hopefully we will have uh, the talk from the expert speaker, which is on the functional anatomy of the cortical brain areas and white matter tracts uh, from our colleague, uh, Dr. Goryanov Sergei, a neurosurgeon at uh, one of the most uh, famous neurosurgical institutions in uh, Russia at the uh, Bordenko Neurosurgery Research Institute in Moscow. So, uh, uh, Professor Kato, uh, before uh, we start the meeting, would you please? Uh, uh, join us with a few comments and uh, welcoming notes. Thank you very much. So the, from the last uh, uh, week, uh, we uh, got uh, two more of uh, the fellows from Bangladesh and the uh, guy uh, from Algeria that he left. So maybe I think uh, I wish them to join the, because they, those are very uh, OYNS, so that I think uh, they must they listen the very uh, great two uh, doctors uh, speech. We are all looking forward to their, their talk. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, Dr. Daniel, uh, can you hear us? And uh, please, if you're ready, can you? Yes, I'm, I'm ready. Good afternoon to you. You are now in, uh, in Moscow. Moscow, yes. Well, thanks for joining us. So whenever you're ready, you have uh, yourself the opportunity to share the slides on your end, and uh, you take your time to start. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. Um, yes, so please share the screen by pressing the button below the share button. I tried to share the screen, but uh, uh, yeah. Dr. Daniel, in case, uh, just to make sure that uh, the signal you have on your end is fine, do you have the green? Share screen button on your screen. Is it is it showing fine on your end? At the very bottom. Can you help him, Ben, to share the screen? Sometimes we can do it through this host, right? 
I see the computer. Yes. No, uh, um, let me see. Yeah, uh, Sharon, you're right. So I Thank you. can you check it now, Daniel? I made a few changes from my end. Um, when I try to share the, the screen, um, everything is like um, empty. Um, so, uh, I try to share the desktop, but it's not allowing me. So maybe you want to close that presentation and open it one more time and then try and share it. No, it's the, the computer because. Um, when I enter in the, the system, say it go to sending. And when I try to log in the sending, it's no one day. I don't know what's going on. Maybe I need to con connect from another computer. I see. Uh... Uh, do it. Uh, it's it's okay. You you can you can try from another computer. Uh, we'll see if uh, we have Doctor Sergey here with us. Give me two minutes. Sure, sure. You can take your time. Um, and unfortunately, I don't see Doctor Sergey here on the list. We have um Dr. Liu, do you have any confirmation that uh, Dr. Sergey is uh, is uh, going to be joining us today? Uh, I think he have confirmed. I just sent him another email. Probably, I think the time difference. Hopefully, that's, he'll join now. That's yes. true. Yes, that's another thing. Yeah. Yeah. Look at Daniel, and now we can see your screen, and that looks uh, fine. Look at Daniel, we can't hear you in case uh, you are muted. Uh, Hello, Doctor Daniel. Yes. Um, now, now we can hear you. I can see your screen, and uh, that's perfect. Now, oh, please, uh, take it away with your presentation. And once again, thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Daniel Encarnacion. Um, I'm from Dominican Republic. And first of all, I want to send to Professor Yoko Kato for the invitation and the opportunity to be here. It's a great honor. Uh, my topic is man management of hydrocephalus as the pelocystico atrocytoma in pediatric patients, second report. Um, Okay, the first that we need to know that the, the term pilocystico is used to describe the stoma to refer cells with cell headed bipolar process. Do they also know that pilocystic atrocytoma are slow growing and when they fight tumor, according to the classification of the World Health Organization? Pilocystic atrocytoma is green one glioma with low cellularity and methodic activity. Metatis is spread extremely weird and so infrequent on the malignant transformation. Pilocytic mm, atrocytoma can occur everywhere in the central nervous system. However, um, 
de cerebro en su masa fértil, 42%, supratentoria, 76%, um, visual power, hipotálamo en brainstem, 9%, en spinal cord, 2%. In children, the cerebellum was most affected in 37%, in two trials, it occurred uh, supratentorially. Filocytic atrocytoma, just one to five percent all intracranial tumors, one to seven percent, or one to seven percent all gland tumors, 70 percent all uh, cerebral atrocytoma in children. And they had the primary brain tumor, and it's the, 0.4%. In children adolescents, they are 17.6%. Uh, and they are only got children on the 40 years of age. Um, most okay. In this report, we describe a case of patients who you can treat for pilocytic atrocytoma who developed a complication of hydrocephalus. And when all, no, on the number of interventions, management of hydrocephalus uh, as the PS surgery, it is it's gonna be discussed. Okay, we had uh, 24 months of being patient were referred to our clinic. A call to the mother at the end of the month of operation was before, a virus on the tumor localized in the cerebellum. At the, uh, two months later, the pathological examination revealed to be a uh, velocity atrocytoma. The procedure removed the mass of person using the intraoperatory ICU and the Marasos Gaia Hospital. Okay. After uh, surgical cessation, any paralysis on the right side, commentary difficulty in clarity remaining. After the shot, her condition worsening. And almost later, she was diagnosed with hydrocephalus. And a ventricular peritoneal shown was implanted with antisiphon. The, the shunting removed more of the symptoms, however, vomiting, headache, and nausea occurred in the upper position. A muscle led the BP shown was removed, and the scopic driven ventricular cystectomy was performed. There was a temporary improvement in the symptoms, following by worsening. Okay, um, two weeks later, the BP shown was implanted. But they shall not recover from the symptoms. And the valve pressure was 300, is two to two days later. And lethargy and drowsiness improved. A week later, she was the shadow witness the facial mass on the left side, a uh, motor strain the three to five on the right side. And then the, the, 10 days later, after the discharge, she was brought to the emergency department with lethargy, lethargy of the winning apatia. The BP show was revived and the anticipant was, was removed. Okay, um, the picture was discharged two days later, only to, to reply the message of the family for first day later with repetitive vomiting and headache. Chronic subdural accumulation, the right parietal region, subdural accumulation, more right density along on the online cerebellum or in the left. And convexity suffered along the occipital lobus fan. And the diagnosis, the diagnosis was over the neck, uh, over the drainage, and a vision was in place. And a vision with antisiphon was placed, and the previous one was removed. Okay, um, we had here in figure one A and B, preparatory CT, with contra, ventricular dilatation. With tumor formation and the posterior cranial fossa, uh, with perivascular edema, and not the possible dilatation, the dilocation, the amygdala, with um, transependent masses of flow, and C, a lipos operatorio with sanochronic sudural collection by frontal. In figure two, we had a preparative MRI with contrast. And the, we had a, a perilational edema with and face on the full ventricle. And see early postoperatory postoperatory post the cavity in the posterior cranial fossa unremarkable. It does not was a sign of residual tumor to tumor tissue. 
and as the shunting, total regression of the triventricular otorotehydrocephalus. Okay. Um, mm. The main that we need to know that hydrocephalus is the main complication associated with sleep intervention, uh, foliation of the posterior cranial fossa. In the incidence in the hydrocephalus, as the posterior fossa tumor removes range from 10 to 40 percent of the patient population. And the real factor for postoperatory hydrocephalus, young age on the two years, medoblastoma, and compression of the brainstem. Interestingly, the histopathology shows atrocytoma p value equal 0 0.003. It was a negative predictor of hydrocephalus. Um, adult population, there is high risk uh, for postoperatory hydrocephalus, but um, we can, a possible pathological explanation may be a slow growth in the tumor. A slow growth in the tumor can lead to development of chronic, hydros, uh, chronic hydrocephalus, decrease in parenchyma and compliance. Um, can lead to rigid of the ventricular walls. Okay, um, we had the CCPIA, Canadian Preoperative Hydrocephalus Prediction Rule, with uh, pediatric patients who has tumoral formation in the posterior fossa, and, and we had uh, possible hydrocephalus. Our components, John A, Linda to Gion, present of papilla edema, Hydrocephalus on preparative imaging. Presentive tumor um, diagnosed uh, medulloblastoma, ependymoma, brace ganglioma, and several metastases. And main score system range from 0 to 10 points, more higher score, more correlated to react to development persistent hydrocephalus. Okay. First, that um, in a modified patient, uh, the presence of the optical discoedema was replaced by uh, radiological evidence of transepidemic uh, cystic flow. And our patient was uh, escorted seized with probability of hydrocephalus at six months after recession of 0.93 value. And preoperative regal analysis should be treated with caution in this kind of patient. Um, another study showed like um, ventricular um, persistent hydrocephalus was most frequently in children with severe preparatory hydrocephalus with p value equal 0 0.002 and melblastoma p value equal 0 0.01. And in addition to the clinical characteristic, the molecular subtype can influence in the development of hydrocephalus and pediatric cord. No, this data is not currently um, uh, likely. And the main risk in our patient may be the, uh, the dilatation that in the lateral ventricle and the transatendimus is a flow or a journey can be a factor to, develop, to the development of postoperatory hydrocephalus. And we know that um, postoperatory hydrocephalus is five times more in children than in adults. Is the common complication that we can find is the bacillus anterior injury. Um, in conclusion, um, this study concludes that early failures are attributed to intraoperatory technical difficulties, so the cervical sign chain, uh, sinus position the cervical floor, and less failure was attributed to closing the stomach or system scarring. Um, take a home messenger. The concept of the problem is employed to the patient with neurological status and the side to be closely monitored and reconciled. Pediatric patient negative effect with uh, repetitive surgery and physical and mentally, don't want them to avoid uh, additional intervention preparatory planning or available to be ocean discussed with the family. Um, Thank you so much for your attention. Arigato gozaimasu. Kasi wacho, muchas gracias.
I'll give a I'll give a colleagues joined here, joining us here today so the opportunity to to engage in conversation rather than a discussion join and speak about the, the challenges that the us in our surgeons face when we get diagnosis with the cancer sedomas, which very often is accompanied by hypersepsis, as you explained. Um, so I'll hold on to the questions for now. Anyone uh, joining us today you would uh, uh, join the conversation? But, uh, so Daniel, thank yeah. you very much for a wonderful talk. So the, now you're working at the uh, Berlingo Institute, but you are originally from uh, which country? Uh, now I am in Moscow, Russia. Well, yeah. I'm from Dominican no. Republic. Yes. Yes, but you are from uh... Dominican Republic. Okay. Uh, is it Africa or? No, no, it's Caribbean country. Uh, next, uh, next to Cuba. Uh, uh, Cuba. Okay, mm -hmm. thanks. Yes. So uh, thank you very much. So uh, I think. Uh, uh, what about the treatment by the, do you use an endoscope? Do you use a pure endoscopic procedure or how you can uh, uh, remove the, the, the lesion? What is the surgical procedure? Just let us know, please. This, uh, um, this case, um, the endoscope was used uh, after to the, the PP shunt because uh, it had numerous you know, failure. In the procedure, but even the the endoscope, uh, uh, um, um, basically, uh, no was successful under 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 Virginia and the, and the treatment. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Yes. Please okay. go ahead. Dr. Daniel, uh, we have one of our colleagues that joined us, wanted to ask a question. Now, I'll give them a moment. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Tio Th 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 Hong. I hope uh, Dr. Tio would be able to ask that question in per, uh, from their end, but just a moment, please. I have that in the chat box and I can then uh, Ask the question, but I hope Dr. T will uh, ask the question first. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, so I want to ask. Um, uh, uh, Doctor Daniel, that um, uh, did the patient were uh, did the patient in uh, short uh, um, a PP shunt before or after the tumor recession? And the second question is um about the reason for the first time the patient had PP shunt removal and had the ETP. Thank you. Um, the the patient had the uh, the repetition after removal of the paralysis because they have the cephalo was present like um post -op post -op but um that's the reason that uh, the endoscopy the 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 was performed after but in in this case um. It, with the repetition was repet repetitive, the, the failure. Um, um, but on um, the final, um, the last repetition work after the, the ATP. And the patient was, uh, after all the, the, 
the the case uh, and the final the patient was recovering so so forth. See, Doctor, uh, uh, Doctor Daniel. Uh, thank you very much for uh, for answering that question. I have uh, I have here on the chat. I see Professor Wozniak joining us. I hope uh, he either has a signal and uh, will uh, be able. Hello. Hello, Professor Musabliu, Professor Kato. I'm sorry for this misunderstanding because I received the letter from Friday and then uh, then I had a problem with with internet. I reconnected, I reconnected to my mobile internet. So, okay, everything, I'm here, I'm with you. And I actually am ready to present my talk because it's prepared if so, if. If I can start, I, I, I'm ready. Yes. Well, uh, Professor uh, Professor Cado, before before I take over, would you please uh, join us just uh, for a moment? Now we have uh, Professor Wozniak or Cado Sensei. Okay, I'll I'll, I'll continue. Professor Wozniak, thank you so thank you very so very much. Uh, it's a good pleasure to have you join us. I can only imagine what uh, what challenges of internet and all all uh, related issues that might be currently in your country. And uh, it's a pleasure to always have you join uh, the ACNS Wineas webinars. Well, I'll uh, without delay, I'll start with the introduction. Professor Alexander Wozniak is the current chief of neurosurgical center at the Clinical Hospital in Fiofnio. My apologies, my pronunciation is not correct, that I can tell. Uh, he is the president of the Ukrainian Association of Neurosurgeons and associate professor of Department of Neurosurgery at the Shupik National Healthcare University and is joining us uh, today from Ukraine. And it's, uh, it's my pleasure to give you the floor and uh, take over with your presentation. Today, uh, Professor Wozniak, if I am uh, correct, and that is going to be the order, Professor Wozniak, you will be presenting uh, surgery of midline uh, cerebral cavernomas. Is that correct? Yes, yes, it's correct. I will explain uh, why I called it uh, midline uh, well, then, cavernoma. Yes, it's it's uh, it's all your time uh, to, to to show us and present uh, your your talk. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, can you hear me and can you see my screen? Can We can hear you, but uh, not a, a shared screen. Oh, one moment, sorry. Let me... This one, sure. Yes, now we can see your screen. Good. Yes, that's perfect. Yes. Oh, is it okay? It looks great. Thank you so much. We can see the screen just fine. Yes. Right, this window. So, dear colleague, dear, dear friends, uh, once more, I apologize. As you see, the presentation was ready, but some technical uh, problems appear. So, finally, I'm with you, and, and uh, thank you very much for that. I'm very glad to see it and to, to hear all of you. Uh, today's talk will be dedicated to actually most, mostly to the meat, to the brainstem cover numbers. But uh, there is a group of cover numbers which are not classified at all. I will speak about it later. It's a cover numbers of uh, thalamic area, hypothalamic area, and optic pathways. They are actually, they're supratentorial, but their behavior is absolutely different from um, uh, hemispheric uh, cover numbers. And, um, 
the cases of this carnoma are not classified at all because they are sporadic. Uh, they are, uh, are, you can find them published one by one without analysis. So that is why I think that these tumors, like tumors of upper brainstem, uh, uh, must be classified as uh, together with the brainstem, brainstem, brainstem uh, carnomas. One moment, it doesn't move. Oh, okay. Um, Carnos angioma, it's a quite rare pathology. Uh, it's not a tumor. It's a vascular malformation, low flow mal malformation. Uh, and this um, origins manifest uh, with uh, micro bleeding and macro bleeding and uh, clinic, uh, their clinical presentation uh, mostly. Uh, uh, caused by the by this increasing volume by means of uh, hematoma and uh, sometimes caverna of this cavernoma. You know the, there are the familiar, not familial. The reason of their origin is not is unclear. From one side, there is of course there is a genetic uh, predisposal, and from the other side, the local the local venous uh, drain also plays a role in formation of this cavernomas because usually in majority of cases we we, we can find the uh, venous malformation of uh, brain aside of uh, the cavernoma and uh, also, uh, when we remove the cavernoma, sometimes the new formation of uh, cavernoma is possible near the, this venous uh, anomaly. Because from the other side we, side, we cannot destroy this anomaly because usually it's a big collector of the vein blood and it drains the, all the adjacent brain around the cavernoma. So this is the problem. Um, majority of cavernomas are silent clinically, and uh, up to six percent of them uh, bleed and manifest uh, yearly. Usually, even less. But once they started to bleed, they uh, rebleed with more and more often. So during during the first year, up to thirty to sixty cavernomas rebleed again. And they cause the permanent neurological de deficit and they lead to invalidization of the patient. That is why during the last years, uh, the problem of treatment of this uh, pathology was discussed very actively. You know, the attempt of uh, to irradiate them with the gamma knife, with a cyber knife, uh, now we do not recommend it at all. And uh, another investigation, because the previous investigation were limited with the two year, two, three years of observation and by secondary bleeding. When uh, the investigators uh, dig it deeper and observed the history, the natural history of cavernomas after secondary ble bleeding. It was very well. It was very well uh, shown that majority of them go on their bleeding at up to 76 and uh, percent during five year observation uh, present with the rebleeding and the patient invalidization. So it, uh, 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 it pushed us to be more active in our surgical uh, strategy. And so far for the last two years, um, we know that the brainstem covering novus um, is quite dangerous pathology, which uh, once which uh, once became um, uh, uh, be became uh, manifested, uh, they they progress and they lead to the uh, to the patient. Uh, deterioration with the time <clears throat> from other side it's uh, well when, well proved that uh, natural history of cavernoma is is much better 
than history of irradiated coronoma. And so, and so far, and for the, for now, the uh, radio surgery for this pathology is absolutely contraindicated. It's well shown statistically. And uh, it's been shown that during an untreated five-year follow-up after second hemorrhage, a significantly increased risk of hemorrhage was found compared with the known risk of first and second hemorrhage. Um, everything, uh, all of this, all this uh, accumulated information led to uh, progression to development of uh, recommendation in management of this pathology. One of the first recommendation was a SAMI publication. Uh, principle of this uh, classification um, was not cancelled uh, the same. So we take into account, we take into account the first bleeding and secondary bleeding and pa patient location of the cavernoma and uh, patient condition. Uh, then there was a, another attempt to propose algorithm by Professor Bertalanti. It worked, the, this one, have been working for a long time. And finally, in 2022, uh, the, the so-called uh, consensus of the leaders in, in this pathology, uh, pathology analyzed that all the, the data they have, and they proposed the new classification, classification which uh, separates the three group of patients. The, the group patient which must be operated on strictly, and the second group which do not require any surgery, and the third group such uh, like a gray zone in this classification, which are not classified, which has no the strict recommendation. And uh, to this group belong the patient with mild deficit, with easy access to the tumor, with the mild deterioration, also with easy access, with difficult access and progressive deficit. So it's a big group, uh, which, uh, are sent to the de decision of this treatment are sent to the doctor uh, to the doctor he must be based on uh, his decision on his uh, experience so and now let me share with you our experience experience of my department for during last more than 10 years and I will focus on indication for surgery timing on surgery approach techniques of surgery and uh, results of our surgery. Uh, I want to, uh, to repeat what I told you before that usually we, we classify the brainstem cavernomas from the, all the brainstem and do not classify the cavernomas of upper brainstem or cavernomas of uh, the hypothalamic area, uh, chiasm and thalamic area. Actually, the blood supply of this area is almost similar to the blood supply of the, of the uh, brainstem. This is absolutely different from the structure of the hemispheres of the brain. And uh, that is why I'd propose I never met it in literature, but I'd propose to classify the uh, cavernomas uh, of uh, uh, hypothalamic uh, area and uh, and uh, optic pathways at the brain stem, at the upper brain stem cavernomas, and I'd propose the same stra uh, management uh, strategy as for the classical brain stem uh, cavernomas. Our material, I'm sorry. Our material was 41 patient until 2020. I, I didn't recalculate it for the 2022. I had some more cases, but they didn't change statistics, believe me at all. Uh, uh, three, three of patients were reoperated. Um, as you can see, the wide spectrum of uh, surgical approaches was used to, for removing of uh, this tumor. Uh, in uh, 
five cases patient uh, were we had a, in five cases sorry in five cases we had we had a recurrence or maybe the nova formation because in, at least in uh, two of these cases the cavernoma was removed completely and i saw it so maybe it was in these two cases of course it's discussable but maybe we had and the uh, cavernomas in these cases formated not at the same place it was formated in the vicinity in the nearby place in the uh, white in the brain stem but anyway the uh, they included in the recurrent cases well why surgery of course for the for today as i told before the surgery is uh, one possible and radical and effective uh, way to treat the patient with the uh, brainstem cavernoma because every uh, next bleeding leads to patient deterioration and uh, the, makes the surgery more complex sometimes and uh, uh, we must be active after the second uh, bleeding of the, the cavernoma. Uh, as, as I told before, uh, our attention will be focused on approach choice and uh, uh, the, some tools which may help us during this surgery. It's a quite, quite a complex surgery. According to approach, first of all, if you if surgeon operates on the skull base uh, and operates the brainstem, it must be um, able to perform all the spectrum of the skull base approach, all around uh, 360 60 degrees from the, from any place due to any bone, you must be, be able to perform. If not, uh, if you if the if surgeon has two approaches in the armamentarium and that's all, it's it's better better not to recommend him to do this uh, this surgery. Excess, <clears throat> according to excess, there is uh, two points. From one side, uh, uh, you know about the so-called uh, entry zone for the brain stem, but unfortunately for patients with the cover norma, entry zones do not work uh, so good as for uh, brain stem tumors, especially in ped pediatric uh, population. Uh, I can explain why because. Uh, once uh, the cavernoma extends, uh, the grades gets bigger, it shifts everything what is around. It doesn't innovate. It just shifts the pathways. It shifts the uh, nucleus. Uh, and that is why the anatomy is not ideal. That is why we always must rely, rely on the a place of cavernoma uh, booting to the surface because usually it could be more safe for entry of the uh, and the of the brainstem and we must and the neurosurgeon must play with uh, both of these uh, possibilities during surgery during surgery another tool preoperative tractography uh, to say, I, we started to do it uh, during recent years, not from the beginning. Of course, it helps. First of all, first of all, because um, the tractography shows uh, where the uh, the uh, pathways are shifted to which side, and how more safely we can enter uh, the brainstem and to penetrate the brain. From the other hand, the neuronavigation navigation neuronavigation may help you, but uh, in my practice, I do not rely on it completely. Um, I always uh, try to have the uh, anatomical approval of uh, uh, my, of my uh, situation in the wound. So only both to, to rely on never neuronavigation completely is not wise for this surgery because you always have minimal shifting shifting at the surgery uh, you use uh, the mri uh, often which is not so um, so uh, precise uh, as a ct for example for the 
for, for the orientation in the wound. So that is why I always uh, rely on both uh, anatomy, especially the posterior fossa. You know, the posterior fossa is very anatomical and uh, it's more convenient to be oriented on, uh, on, the, uh, on the anatomical structure. But all, of course, neuro navigation helps and we, uh, we always use it and always rely more or less. I had the case uh, of not cavernoma, but with the multiple uh, hemangioblastoma, uh, Hippelindau, uh, and uh, I re removed six uh, hemangioblastoma, uh, hemangioblastomas from the posterior fossa during one procedure. If I had no, uh, if I had no neuro navigation understand that it, it's uh, it was impossible to do that that's here really this tool this tool helps but uh, always with some critics uh interoperative neuromonitor so it's a tool we cannot uh, i think that so by now uh, we cannot do this surgery of the brainstem without uh, neuromonitoring at all uh, if uh, you didn't read this uh, article by Professor Bertalanti, I I recommend it highly. What he showed, what the main idea of this article, that the uh, nuclei in the rhomboid fossa uh, allocated is very individual. There is no uh, strict anatomical location of the of the uh, cranial nerves uh, 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 nucleus and that is why they must they must be adjust uh, adju uh, uh, must be adjusted by uh, neurophysiology in every in every uh, uh, in every case in every case at the, at the time of procedure According to surgery, uh, when we plan our surgery, when we perform the surgery, first of all, we are looking for the short way to the uh, lesion. We try to use the simple approaches to to do to, to the lesion, and always have the the uh, the place of the brain stem which is mostly booted to the to the surface. Uh, I prefer the existing. Um, Oh, I recommended all of the surgeons recommend the excision of cavernoma without adjacent uh, brainstem tissue. In contrary to the cavernoma supratentorial cavernoma, that you know where it's if it's possible, it's recommended to remove all the surrounding uh, surrounding tissue because it's a, it's a, very often it's a epileptogenic zone. Uh, coagulation. I, I usually I will show it later. Coagulate the cavernoma inside of the brainstem, and I always try to preserve the draining uh, vein. So let us go to move to the cases, uh, and let us start from the rostral part, from the medulla oblongata. The case like this, the second secondary bleeding. Uh, you know. Uh, there is a problem. We cannot use the midline incision of the rhomboid fossa because of the threat of the, the damage of the sensitive fibers. That is why for this location, it's obliged to use uh, the, the way through the posterior lateral sulcus. Uh, sulcus like here, this is a full lateral approach. Full lateral approach. Uh, 11th nerve 11th nerve uh, we must be we must be very careful with the level 11th because if we, we sacrifice at least one or two small contributors of the 11th we can lead to the serial de serious def deficit uh, in this uh, patient that is why we walk in the window it's quite difficult to find the posterior lateral sulcus because uh, the surface is smoothed and uh, you don't see you must look for it uh, more rostrally or more caudally more caudally in this case we found and you see i i do not I do not drag the cavernoma. I irrigate all the time. Have the clear, clear feel. Have the, have the clear, 
uh, have a clear difference between the brainstem and then I remove the blood, I shift, uh, I shrink the uh, cavernoma, coagulate and cut uh, all the feeders and all the adhesions around the cavernoma. If I will try to drag it, uh, I will rupture the small vessels, they will start to bleed and uh, to stop this bleeding. So, okay, with the cavernoma, it will remove it in one piece. I was absolutely, absolutely sure that, that it's removed completely. This is the control. In many years, uh, this patient uh, came with another cavernoma. I, I did not include this case in the vicinity, not in, not here, just more about, more about. It was, it was another another cavernoma. So I and I think uh, it's still. I do not. I didn't operate. Uh, I st I still observe this patient as it doesn't bleed, but. Uh, in this case, was a new cavernoma formation. When we, we go uh, more rosterly, the next big group of uh, cavernomas, uh, the biggest group of brainstem cavernoma, the cavernoma of the pons. Uh, there are two possibilities. Here we can move uh, uh, from the posterior, but of course, of course, if we can, uh, only in cases when the cavernoma really abuts to the surface. So when it's, it was located deeper, I would not recommend to use the posterior. It's better to use the lateral approach. The same, I, I remind you, that we always uh, must uh, electrophysiologically to find the nuclei of the seventh nerve, sixth nerve, and only after that, after that, using the uh, either supra or infrafacial triangles to penetrate uh, the the brainstem and operate on. In this uh, case, uh, uh, it was interesting. Uh, oh yes, and really, uh, the another option is moving around. It's uh, for, uh, using the regular retrosigmoid approach to remove this uh, this uh, cavernomas. In this case. This patient had a uh, first bleeding, a clinically first bleeding, and I decided to wait. But in one week, he rebleed, so we operated him in the emergency. It was, uh, I think, it was maybe my first case. Uh, we performed the lobular. Now I, we, I found the facial nerve the nucleus. Then we penetrated penetrate the brainstem step by step. In this case, it was impossible to remove the, the cavernoma in one piece because it was a huge uh, adherent uh, and that is why it was removed peacefully, piecemealy, piece by piece. By piece. What, what is very important is irrigating and the clear field, uh, field. All the time, surgeon must do absolutely under, under, under the visual control and avoid completely any blind manipulation, any blind manipulations. This is the patient. You can see the residual, residual hemosiderin around there. Uh, he had the bilateral six nerve palsy for about three months, three months. Uh, then he recovered completely. Now he's without deficits. So I observed him for more than 10 years and I'm happy about this case. Moving on, the same, the Pontine uh, Cavernoma, second bleeding. You can see that there is no way to use the posterior approach, but it's absolutely, absolutely why is it to use the lateral approach? Uh, Suboccipital retrosigmoid approach was used with a good result with this post op CT. I lost uh, this patient from the further observation, but if something was wrong, I think it had come to me. Uh, the most difficult. Uh, for me, I think it's for me, it's most difficult, the midbrain cavernoma, especially, especially the ventral part, uh, ventral part of the brainstem. Of course, it's, uh, there is no choice uh, for cavernoma like, the, like this, except uh, the transylvian approach. Um, 
to say that I was happy about this approach, I cannot. Of course, I removed it, but it was very difficult. There were many, many perforators around. It was uh, the quite deeper, quite deep uh, wound, uh, operative wound. And uh, now this uh, cavernoma was removed almost completely, but um, I wasn't sure that I removed it completely. Uh, I I think maybe I removed the part, but for a long years, uh, they, he, he comes to me for controls and nothing grows, nothing grows, and uh, he's uh, stable, he's uh, absolutely stable clinically. Uh, another midbrain cavernoma, the young was ch child at that time, she was child, um, patient with uh, multiple cavernomas. Uh, in this case, I decided to use the Kavasa approach. Maybe uh, maybe this time I'd use the, uh, the subtemporal, uh, suboccipital subtemporal, but that time you can see this uh, interoperative photo, the, I cut the tentorium, and uh, the cavernoma was removed completely. Um, unfortunately, we had the regrowth of the cavernoma. She was reoperated once again. Um, now she's stable, everything is fine. And the third option for the uh, for the midline midbrain cavernoma, uh, for cavernomas of the quadrigeminal plate, uh, of course it's a sub subtemporal, a uh, subtentorial approach like this. You can see uh, I move under the tentorium. Here is the tentorium. It's a internal cerebral vein. This uh, beside of I, I rely on, uh, uh, on neuron navigation, but it's better to have the uh, orientation anatomical. This is the epiphysis, this internal cerebral vein. Then I move a little bit laterally from this and looking for the cover number. In this case, uh, what's the point? I, uh, I shifted all the vessels, this even the smallest vessel from the surface of the quadrigeminal plate not to sacrifice anything it took time time and fortunately in this case i had this a red spot on the surface it was a really a booting place and i was happy you see after the hematoma removed i had a space for manipulations step by step i shrinked the the cover noma one by one very very low uh, very low power of bi bipolar must be used not to hit the surrounding uh, brainstem and then step by step but uh, i never uh, try to rupture the bands and the vessels i always coagulate and cut them on the sharp wave of dissection never try to remove the hematoma, chronic hematoma capsule. And only after this, I remove the cavernoma by one piece. You can see the post-op view. This is MRI in three months. It's no new deficit. Uh, patient is good condition, in good condition. This case, I decided to present this case because it's a very um, demonstrative in terms of uh, timing of surgery. Uh, this is a young guy, professional dancer. Uh, he came with a really uh, with the static uh, disturbances, with the balance disturbances. Uh, I suppose I suppose that he had multiple bleeding, but they were were subclinical. But finally, in case of this, uh, in this patient with the fresh bleeding and extension of the hematoma, at least hematoma from the thalamic area to the uh, lower uh, pons, we decided to wait. So we uh, were waiting for two weeks in this patient. Fortunately, he had no bleedings, and after this, uh, after that. We used uh, sub uh, tentorial uh, sub occipital approach. Uh, fortunately, all the hematoma was liquid, and it, it was drained during surgery. 
and you can see that almost the minimum cavity uh, lost the patient without new deficit and moreover he returned to his uh, normal uh, work as a dancer now let us move to the supratentorial midline tumors this is a patient with a second bleeding uh, to the hypothalamic area um, and he was operated, it's very short video, he was operated, this uh, cavernoma inside, uh, through the transcalosal and through the foramen of Monroe at the bottom of the third ventricle, very short video. It was removed, removed completely without, uh, without uh without any recurrence but unfortunately a uh, patient suffers from obesity after surgery that's a problem actually it's a problem of majority of uh, patients we, which were operated on on the hypothalamic area but uh, but concerning the cavernoma he's absolutely safe and cavernoma is removed completely and one moment. This is a control. And the last case, uh, the case of uh, cavernoma of the chiasm. I had two cases like this. Uh, the problem starts. Pro the problem starts from uh, the diagnosis of uh, this uh, tumor. Uh, this one was uh, sent to me as a patient with uh, a malignant glioma of the optic pathways, according to MRI uh, uh, data. And I decided to revise to obtain the to obtain uh, histopathology of this of the patient because young patient to to be passive in this uh, situation was not wise. That is why I used frontal lateral approach. Actually, I started and I went for biopsy. Uh, then uh, I uh, unroofed the optic canal. You can see it. there was a. Uh, I didn't use any drill because you see this is a, this is a roof of the optic canal. No drilling was required due to continuous uh, compression. Now I will cut the falciform ligament. You can see the strangulating stripe here and now i move uh, along the optic nerve to the chiasm and i, I see the blood the blood and at this stage i already almost understood that this is the cavernoma cavernoma of the optic very rare pathology uh, at this time there were only 29 cases of pathology like this uh, reported in the world literature and we reported also it uh, it was published and this case was published then with the same fashion, but only here I did here I didn't want to remove the cavernoma in one piece to minimize the traumatization of the optic nerve. And step by step, step peacefully, in absolutely clear field. Uh, I insist on it. The, the field must be clear without blood. It must be very well irrigated to see all the, the borders of coronoma all the time, irrigation and irrigation and irrigation. So this is the final view. One moment. So, okay, let us go to the summary. So in our practice, the first bleeding with a progressive deterioration or second hemorrhagic event usually were the indication uh, for the surgery. Timing. Timing was very individual. You cannot predict. We cannot predict. Uh, of course, it's, uh, it's some. It's uh, there is a sense to wait to deal with the liquid blood, not with the clot. But sometimes maybe clot is easier for removal. So that is why it must be very very individual according uh, due to the patient condition and so on so on so on surgery. We use the big spectrum uh, spectrum of. Uh, approaches we didn't use the extra complex approaches we tried to have uh, the shortest way to the cavernoma and always have uh, in the middle the place of cavernoma boot into the surface we never operated on deep-seated cavernomas so when we are not sure that we can safely uh, approach it in surgical technique as i told you irrigation is uh, crucial for uh, the surgery 
I always shrink the angioma in the bed. Uh, in the then I sharply coagulate and uh, dissect uh, the bands and the small vessels. So always pre I preserve the draining vein, which located the side very often, and uh, I never touch it with the adjacent brain. In conclusion. Want to say the surgery of uh, brain stain and midline cavernoma require mastery of wide range of surgical approaches to the brain stem. Uh, knowledge of the key of the entry zones of the brain stem is important, but the use for this cavernoma is limited and should be verified by intraoperative neuromonitoring and uh, anatomical uh, landmarks uh, inside of the wound. Complete removal of this cavernomas doesn't guarantee its recurrence in the same place or in the vicinity. Uh, asymptomatic recurrent uh, cavernomas should not be operated on if they do not bleed and do not manifest uh, clinically. Since uh, there is currently no agreed protocol for the management of uh, uh, cavernomas of the midline F uh, and brace. Instead, the experience of a neurosurgeon plays a key role in uh, their uh, uh, successful uh, treatment. Thank you very much. If you have any questions or discussion, I'm ready. I'm at your disposal. Professor Wozniak, uh... Thank you once again for um, joining us, <clears throat> considering uh, technical difficulties, but um, <clears throat> I want to thank you especially for uh, putting together this uh, wide range of uh, cases from your experiences. And you covered the entire span of anatomy from, uh, from brainstem uh, all the way supratentorially, and it seems the experience of yours have collected very, very challenging and difficult cases. So thank you for sharing that with us. So you, you mentioned uh, um, uh, how you approached, uh, you used your uh, your experience to guide you through through the decisions that you made, uh, why you called this midline at the same time. I understand that it was the pathology that led you to understand that the classification is based on vascular supply in most cases and locations of this. Is that correct? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. Uh, it's a very, mm, it's a very discussable question, but uh, but uh, but by according to the mm, threat of uh, patient deterioration, uh, the threat of uh, permanent deficit, especially the permanent mm -hmm. deficit uh, in this patient, so we must be really more active. Uh, surgically in, in, in this patient because you understand the visual loss uh, the, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really dramatic for any patient and there is no sense to use the protocol for supratentorial uh, cavernoma in patient with uh, especially in the optic pathways uh, uh, cavernoma that, that is why it's my personal of option. I never met him in the literature. Uh, but, uh, I, in my practice, I, I really do, I really use this protocol for patient, for, for patient with uh, the paranormal. I cannot prove it anatomically or embryologically. I just can prove it uh, clinically. Clinically because of, first of all, to avoid the patient's deterioration in, in the future. I understand. So, uh, taking that leap and using uh, this opportunity, you mentioned the clinic, uh, the presentation of your patients for you to guide on the decision of uh, future treatment steps. Now, I want to use that and uh, add uh, to the questions. Uh, a question from uh, Security Chohan, who is uh, currently a fellow at Fujita, uh, is asking about the frequency of uh, seizures either before or following the surgical treatment in your case series. Uh, so you mean the seizures? 
uh, galactic sugars. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, no, they're not absolutely typical for the brains can cover normals. Uh, they, they, they had, no, uh, if you if you saw the case of a um, girl with a multi, if you remember with the multiple uh, cover normals, which was yes. operated on with the uh, with the Kavase, uh, they that girl has a epicyndrome and she got the anticonvul sense because she had the she was operated on before in the very young age uh, due to a frontal loc located uh, cavernoma with the huge bleeding and she had some more cavernomas uh, supratentorially but uh, the therapy therapy was uh, more or less effective it was a pediatric she, she, she it was a pediatric uh, case and she was observed by the pediatric neurologist and neurosurgeons that I operated her. So that was the only one case uh, with the seizures from this area. All others uh, had no, because it's not typical for brainstem cavernomas at all. So yeah. the seizures are typical for uh, for the supratentorial uh, cavernomas located near the cortex. Mm -hmm. uh out of curiosity, have you had the opportunity to follow or to uh, to investigate on the occurrence of uh, familiar cavernomas in members of your patients? You had cases presented that are of uh, of uh, pediatric yeah. age. Do you yes. have such Thank information? You. Uh, in my in my clinic, I do not observe them because I have only sporadic cases from the first and from the, from the other hand, I am not a pediatric. Uh, usually, the pediatric neurosurgeons send to me such uh, difficult cases like like this, and I I send them back to the pediatrics uh, pediatrics again. So, so I cannot uh, collect them and analyze them the, mm -hmm. the cases like this. Uh, is there any other question for Professor Wozniak from uh, the the audience? Uh, Professor Wozniak, just uh, one one co uh, question. Um, excellent presentation. I think uh, very step by step, um, especially for the YNS uh, attending today. Just like to um, clarify. So uh, the indication, like you said, it's usually uh, first time with worsening symptoms or the second time presentation again. Uh, I would like to know, do you do the surgery? So usually all the surgeries are done by the first three weeks so that, you know, you get the proper um, ring enhancement with the bleed, you know, the clot area to define your surgery. Or have you done any that pass those, those uh, acute period or sub-acute period surgery? Mm, I don't understand it clearly. Excuse me. So you mean uh, that the acute period is uh, it means uh, three weeks, uh, and uh, the patient if patient doesn't deteriorate during this period, I do not operate. Yes. So uh, this is the key. You operated any patients after those periods, like later, maybe three months later or six months later? Have you had any experience there? Uh, no, no, I, I told you that I am orient, orient, oriented completely on the clinical presentation, clinical manifestation. If, if the patient doesn't deteriorate, I do not operate uh, him. I, I observe. And the uh, time after two, three weeks and month is, doesn't, doesn't matter. And even I have cases where the um, cavernoma gets bigger uh gets bigger but with, without any clinical uh, um, clinical deterioration i i still observe the, the patient like this and uh, if you will observe them uh, um, further you will see that the blood will will disappear and the and the hematoma will shrink with time so hematoma, it's a natural life of uh, cavernoma. No one knows uh, the reason of their formation, but one of the hypotheses says that the reason is the uh, microthrombosis of small veins. And due to this microthrombosis, the vein uh, becomes to extend. And finally, the uh, very thin wall ruptures, and we have a, a bleeding because of this. And one of the recommendations, one of recommendations, so the latest recommendation is the, the um, consuming of a small dose of aspirin. 
for a patient with uh, cover norma. It's not proven yet, but uh, this recommendation disappeared. And some uh, some investigators say uh, that it lets to decrease the number of uh, bleeding from the from cover norm. So maybe in the future we will have uh, more proven results if it will be, we will come to recommendation because it looks uh, it looks uh, wise uh, to really to prevent the small microthrombosis in the in the in the cover number. So maybe. Thank you, Professor. You're welcome. So Alexander, thank you very much for a great picture. As always, yeah. I can hear. So just uh, I would ask because you said that uh, radio surgery for the cavernoma is the contraindication. You said so. Uh, what's the difference? Because for the so so many the YNS is listening in your lecture. So so what's the difference of the pathology? Why the radio surgery does not work for the cavernoma? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Cut. It was a discussable question, but uh, I rely on uh, the objective literature data. Uh, the recent publication uh, by um, by the Professor Ulrich uh, by Professor Sir Ulrich Sure. He he publicated. He just publicated the biggest. Uh, uh data based on the population uh, population investigation just population he observes the very big number of patients during many many years and he he proved he proved statistically proved that there is no sense to irradiate cover numbers because the the uh, they bleed even more often after irradiation than uh, the cavernomas, which were not irradiated. It's proven. I, I based on his publications, and I had a discussion with him personally, not once, about this. Here and uh, he and he proved me to do that. From the other hand, I operated uh, the irradiated cavernomas. Uh, I can say that it's, uh, they're technically more difficult than non non irradiated, especially in my experience. Not not big experience. There are not so. Uh, they're not, not more scary, so that he's adhered to so on, so on, so on. So because in, in Japan, we have uh, several, the big center of the gamma knife. So mm -hmm. they try to do the uh, <coughs> try uh, for the heronoma even. So maybe some uh, <coughs> histopathological <coughs> target is a bit different from uh, AVM. <coughs> I agree with you, but I, I read the Japanese uh, reports, and sometimes they are very different. I sometimes I even was surprised. So, so there are one showed good results, one sent another center so uh, so not so good results. Uh, that is why we must be um, a bit to accept all this information information a little bit critically. Maybe also, I'm sorry. Also, they it's a there is a, some mis uh, mismatch misunderstanding between the surgery and uh, and irradiation because when we, we analyze uh, the patient after uh, uh, irradiation, we analyze the bleeding. But when we analyze the patient after surgery, we analyze uh, the recurrence. Uh, there's absolutely di di different cat categories for, for analysis. <laughs> so, uh, that is why I'm as a surgeon, and uh, I, uh, I'm absolutely sure that this pathology, um, in majority of cases, must be treated by, by surgery. Thank, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Wozniak, uh, one of our fellows from Fujita is asking, do you have any any classification that you use uh, for your brainstem uh, cases? Uh, mm. Oh, thank you. The it's grading, the grading uh, that you might be using. Uh, no, I don't. I use uh, the existing uh, classification. So maybe maybe I will propose sometimes to, to join the uh, supratentorial midline at, uh, and uh, and uh, 
uh, raised and covered numbers. Maybe I will propose later on. But uh, from the other kinds, I, I use the existing classification and I rely on location. I rely on uh, a, bo a booting of the cover number. Maybe size, but size is not so 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 important. The clinical condition is more, more important. As you you saw the tremendous uh, um, Pontine cover noma, but patient has a minimal clinical manifestation with a six nerve palpy and maybe it was a little bit, a little bit confused and some headache. From the other hand, with a small cavernoma at the lower brainstem can lead to very serious uh, neurological deterioration of the patient. So, in, so I, I as, as a surgeon, I do not rely so much on classification. I rely on remarks like location, uh, location, bleeding, patient condition, uh, uh, booting of the uh, uh, of the cavernoma. That's also. Only, only practical things for, for to perform the surgery or not to perform it. Thank you, Professor Wozniak. Thank you. It's um, very interesting. It's challenging, but it's great to have that experience of yours shared with us, uh, especially with the technical uh, difficulties that you face on a daily basis. You still joined us. Thank you. Thank you so very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now, if I might uh, check with um, Yasin Felicis, is, is, uh, is available to join us for our next talk? Yasin, can you hear me? Is anyone? I see. Looking for. Excuse me, I can't oh, hear you, sorry, Professor. Who is uh, you are looking for? Yasin. Yasin Felis is uh, Yasin. about. Yes. Yasin. Sorry, sorry, but because he is now in Asahikawa in Hokkaido, and mm. the internet situation is not so nice. So maybe next time he said. Maybe next time. <laughs> well, then uh, we have come uh, to the end of our talk for today. Uh, we had a different order of start and finish, but it went just fine. Um, I guess we should stay with that order. We start with a young uh, neurosurgeon and then we close uh, with a senior, as is in the case of Professor Wozniak. So uh, thank you to all attendees for joining us and the presenters especially, Dr. Encarnacio Santos for joining us from Moscow and then Professor Wozniak to having the capstone talk for us uh, today. Uh, before yeah. I, I conclude, Professor Kato, would you please join yeah. us? To... Dr. Fawad from Afghanistan, he raised a hand. Yes, now I see you. My apologies, I missed that. Professor <laughs> Fawad Pirzad, so great to have you joining us from Afghanistan. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much. Just, just I, I would like to say, uh, Salam, Konnichiwa. Thank you, uh, Professor uh, Buzniak. It's very excellent presentation. And uh, I would like to say congratulations for your achievement. We are proud of you. Thank you very much. Arigatou. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank, you, thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank, thank you. you so much. Okay. Aaron, I think uh, we should close this webinar. Uh, yes. It, it, uh, it was one of those uh, special ones, one of a kind, and uh, I'm lucky the one to have been uh, here with you today. So, uh, Daniel and Karnatia, thank you so much for joining us. Professor Bosniak, in time of difficulties, uh, we thank you for joining us. It's always a pleasure to have you as a speaker, as a co-chair, as a panelist. You've always been a great help to the community of uh, the Asian Congress and beyond. Professor Kato, uh, I think I would be happy for you to uh, to join and uh, give me the honor instead for you to do the final and, uh, remarks of closing. And Sharon, before I, I leave, it's always a pleasure to be by your side in these uh, talks that we organize. Thank you. To Ben, of course, to Liu, uh, 
I guess uh, we have Joe joining as well to all of us uh, joining. Uh, thank you so very much. And then Professor Kato, maybe you will have the closing remarks for us today. Thanks, not, not closing remark. Uh, just I want to ask Bosnia, do you have some Christmas time is in December? Uh, no, I, we have not due to the war January. time. We have no celebration at all. Uh, we are busy all the time. We have no oh. vacations uh, for special vacation for the for this time. Maybe one day at least. Mm -hmm. It's maximum. Mm -hmm. Okay, then all the best for your life. I think. Thanks so much. Uh, it was wonderful the webinar, especially for the uh, YNS. I think uh, please, uh, Dr. Daniel, uh, you learned a lot from uh, many the senior doctors uh, at your institute. So just you can bring it back to your country. I think. Bosnik, thank you very much for it's a very difficult region, I think. Yeah, but I think uh, <laughs> for the younger generation, yeah. I don't know if they can do the surgery just like you, I think. Maybe in the future, it's more and more less invasive. So maybe we can figure out some uh, another uh, treatment for the caminoma, I think. <laughs> thank anyway, you. Thank, you, thank very you very much. Thank you. Okay. okay. See you next time. Bye-bye. See you. Bye. Bye. Bye.